Hey guys, it's Matt Schrader. Even though I'm lurking behind the scenes this season of Score the Podcast, I wanted to tell you about Blockbuster, the story of Steven Spielberg, George Lucas, and John Williams. It's releasing weekly now on Apple Podcasts. Just search Blockbuster. And this week you'll hear the moment John first played the Jaws theme for Steven Spielberg, a moment that launched his career and the first meeting with George Lucas uh, that John Williams had for a project called The Star Wars. Maybe you're familiar with it. Check it out. The new episode is out today and every Tuesday. And this week we're partnering with Mondo Records for a collector's edition vinyl of the Jaws soundtrack. That giveaway you can enter by following Blockbuster on Twitter and Facebook and get more information. Blockbuster, it's a movie for your ears. Subscribe now. Hey, Score fans, it's Kenny. So glad to be back for Season 2. Hope you're enjoying it so far. We wanted to include a bonus episode of our conversation with Seinfeld composer Jonathan Wolf. We had the chance to chat with Jonathan for about a half hour. And, uh, of course, in the Henry Jackman episode, we included just a snippet of that interview. So if you're a Seinfeld fan like I am, or you're just interested in the -the behind-the-scenes process of how a theme song comes together, here now is the entire interview from our theme song throwback segment celebrating 30 years of Seinfeld. Oh, wow. It's theme song throwback. Awesome. 75 primetime network series he's written music for, 44 TV show themes, and uh, actually there's a little connection here. Um, joining us is Jonathan Wolf. Thank you so much for joining us, Jonathan. He yeah, is the composer cool. of Seinfeld, most notably, and that's what we want to talk about today. How are you, Jonathan? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Kenny, Robert, it's an honor. I want oh, to I want to jump in really quick though because you guys share a bond and I don't know if you know this Jonathan or maybe you do. Who's the boss? Oh, that's right. That's right. I record I re-recorded your I reproduced a new version of that for you guys. Yes, I don't think I first of all was aware that you were involved in that re-recording. I actually heard the new theme song. I'm not sure how many times it was recorded about a year later and thought uh, nobody called me. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, <laughs> needless to say I, I was still the author of the theme song, but I think the network just kind of moved on to record different versions, different singers and nobody I, I think what they said was don't tell Rob. I didn't even know. <laughs> And, welcome uh, to Hollywood. Yeah, huh? that was Welcome to Hollywood 101. But thank you. Whatever you did, I'm still getting the check, so you must have done a good job with your re-record. Well, let's. I want to get to Seinfeld, so let's catch everybody up on uh, your life. You moved to Hollywood at 17 years old, took a leap of faith. You worked on dozens, at this point, uh, television shows, some that made it, some that fell flat. But I guess that's you know the way it goes when you're writing TV themes and composing for television. Um, you got to kiss a lot of frogs. <laughs> yeah, you could chart the whole course of my career by that long trail of mushroom clouds and blast craters behind me. Boy, people don't seem to believe that when somebody says, "How'd you get?" You know, you hit it out of the park. How'd you get so successful? They they never see the. 300 swings yeah of the i was bat. gonna say people are probably like oh you won the lottery with seinfeld but you also played the lottery and lost <laughs> all your dollars on the powerball up until you actually won so for a while there i was like the kevorkian of tv shows oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's great so yeah if we can fast forward to to where this began you had a working relationship with the comedian george wallace yes in real life jerry seinfeld has a best friend named George. Oh, that's perfect. <laughs> and uh, Jerry called me, and I, you know, I never who's, who had ever heard of Jerry Seinfeld before that. In, fact, in the early days, before I had a life, and occasionally he and I would hang out. We went somewhere to pick up something, his laundry or his his sunglasses or something. And you know, he said Seinfeld. It's under Seinfeld, and they couldn't find it. And they went, uh, oh, oh, here. Steinfeld. Nice. <laughs> and Jerry turned to me and said, "What do you figure it takes?" <laughs> it takes a hit show that does a hundred episodes and a hundred million bucks. That'll never happen again. Yeah, yeah. Now it's now it's the other way around. People, if your name is Steinfeld, forget it. So, so he said, expect a call. What was why? What what was the story behind that? Well, 
there are a whopping four episodes ordered. Oh no! In your Robert, tell me this: in your entire career, except for Seinfeld, have you ever heard of a show having four episodes ordered? No, that's just so odd. It's a number that doesn't make sense on some yeah. levels. It's like we don't that's really not an order. We that's don't really insult. believe in this. But, yeah. but we'll give you a <laughs> anyway, couple shots. Anyway, he called me, but he's a friend of George's. So I figure, okay, I'll do the four episodes. They're going to burn them off in the summertime. And Jerry described to me in that first phone call the following sound design problem. It wasn't really a music issue. It was a sound design thing. He envisioned hmm. the opening credits of his show. At the time, it was a pilot called the Seinfeld Chronicles mm -hmm. to center on Jerry performing stand-up comedy relating to the storyline of the episode. Hmm. And he wanted a catchy, recognizable signature music theme that would play along with his comedy monologue, but that would not interfere with the audio of his stand-up material. And that, to me, sounded like a recipe for conflict. Yes, no kidding. Audio conflict. Because yep. remember, uh, at the time... Late 80s, theme music was melodic, a lot of silly, li silly lyrics and sassy saxophones. Yeah, jazzy kind of yeah. saxophones. and G Guilty. I, com I created a lot of that kind of music, but it was not going to work here. So I watched some of his comedy material and noticed that Jerry's delivery has a unique, funny rhythm to it. Old people in Florida, they drive slow. And they sit low. <laughs> right? That is their motto. The state flag of Florida should be like a steering wheel with a hat and two knuckles on it. The pacing of his words, the phrases and inflections have a musical quality. I based the rhythm of the Seinfeld theme on the rhythms of his speech patterns. Perfect. And Jerry's voice became the melody of the theme. And I pitched that to him on the phone. How about we make your human voice telling jokes, the melody, and every time you do a different monologue, it'll be a variation on the theme. And that left turn signal on for when they left the house that morning. <laughs> right? That's a legal turn in Florida. It's known as an eventual left. My job, Jerry, will be to accompany you uh, in, a, in a way that is creative, but does not interfere with what's going on. And all people get to a certain age where when they back out of the driveway, they don't look. You know what I mean? They're, they're, they just feel like, well, I'm old and I'm coming back. I survived. Let's see if you can. For example, Jerry, the organic human nature of your human voice might go well with the organic human nature of my human lips and tongue and finger snaps like this <laughs> <laughs> and i had his attention because as you know anytime you're doing a pitch you got to get their attention right away no so kidding. looking around and i come on over i'll show you how it works so he came over and the bass line that a lot of people know, it, in general, is in an audio range that does not compete with his voice. Oh, I was actually, I had the lips queued up to play, but uh, that was a way better experience uh, with the yeah. the live well, popping. We'll see if I popped this mic out, but, you know, <laughs> I sent you some anyway. Anyway, since his stand-up comedy routine was different each episode the theme music had to be adapted each week to fit his routine this is unique at the time right i mean most, oh, yeah. this, most this, shows this, didn't have a new variation sometimes they have that nowadays but things have evolved yeah, no, a little bit from, it was from mars at the time i was about yeah. to say you worked much harder than i did clearly your success is so well deserved because there uh, were only four episodes. Oh, shoot. Yeah, right. <laughs> it wasn't that big of a It was commitment. so ambitious, it well, sounds. And if, if people don't know your background, you're classically trained in every possible way. You're a sight-reading yeah. musician, and your, your biggest hit sensation is this 
not even yeah. really a theme, but a sound design thing. Was that weird for you? Did you feel like you were stepping out of all this time you spent learning classical music? No, no, it was, it's all good. Sometimes the best way to approach an assignment is to throw away everything you learned and you know that's a wise man Uh, sometimes that for example i i worked for years on married with children by design by necessity that music had to be sophomoric Hmm. but i'm surprised first of all the greatest news of this story so far is that jerry didn't hear you go and say okay that guy's crazy. Can we find somebody who's actually going to write thematic music that's traditional? Because who would think that he'd be open to that? And then the next part is, what did the suits of which I speak, because I was one for a while, what did they say when they heard some of these ideas? Well, the good news is there was no, but no chair at Castle Rock with a person sitting in it like you sat. Oh, and- Okay. Yep. It was Castro. It was new. There, this whole TV thing was new to them, and I was on the ground floor of it. Uh, Jerry liked the music. Larry liked because you know that, that day when Jerry came over, and I just came up with that bass line, that yep. simple, embarrassingly, ridiculously simple bass line. Uh, he held the phone up to the speakers and called. Larry David and Larry heard it over the phone and said, Hey, that sounds pretty funny. I like it. Oh God. That's so great. <laughs> so that approval process was easy. By the way, at the time slap bass had not yet enjoyed celebrity status mm. as a solo instrument. Mm-hmm. It was still buried in funk music as yep. an element. I brought it forward, manipulated the sounds did all kinds of weird Frankenstein stuff to it and uh, made it a solo instrument. And it was, it, you're right. It was kind of weird. Did you, um, I, I don't know if this is revealing state secrets, but slap bass was a, both a preset on lots of Yamaha and Roland keyboards. Yeah. And there were also fantastic slap bass players in Hollywood that you could call Freddie Washington, for example, yeah. Nathan East, Abel Boreal, was it either or for you, or did you try live players versus the sampled slap bass on a synth? Which worked best? Once the show was picked up, it was clear that this was going to be keyboard triggered, Hmm. these samples. But for the first couple, sure, I experimented with both. Uh, I'm the bass player. um, And, you know, there's all these wonderful online myths, these music wonks that say, oh, it was you know, a DX7 or it was an M1, whatever. It's funny, the, just the whole notion that I would use one of those factory sounds for Seinfeld. If it were that simple, anyone could replicate it. Yep. The real story about that Seinfeld Sonic brand the Seinfeld bass sounds were Frankenstein engineered from multiple sampled bass guitars using sample edits, compression, EQ, phase manipulation, gain staging. I triggered the notes using a keyboard controller. No synth for you. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, But they were originally custom samples. In fact, There were multiple Seinfeld basses throughout the show. It became a thing around my office for my staff to leave me little gift bass samples to weave into Seinfeld cues. And that's how the Seinfeld sound evolved over time. Is it all your mouth sounds? Yes. Yeah. Amazing. Just incredible. Yeah, that was was the easy part of it. Um, You asked about the approval food chain. Yeah, at NBC, what did they think? The NBC. See, anytime you create a new species of music, anytime you try and go outside the box, in your film, Danny Elfman said, you know, there's only one rule. There are no rules. There are no rules. But there is an approval process. <laughs> yeah. So anytime you do that, it's possible 
that not everyone in that approval chain is going to be open to such risk taking. Yeah. And in the case of NBC, uh, once the four had aired and, you know, nobody saw those four episodes, uh, we just assumed we were done. But there were a couple people at the network who really believed in the show. There was a meeting and I was at the meeting because number one on the list was the music. Wow. That if we're going to do a second season, these are the things we want changed. And Larry David was there and Jerry was there. And uh, let's talk about the music. He said, what is that sound? Is that even an instrument? Could we not afford real music? It's, it's weird. It's distracting. It's annoying. <laughs> and at that, Larry David's beady eyes lit up. He goes, what? What? Is it, it's annoying? Really? And I said to Larry, look, I'll change the music. It, look at that list. It's a long list. you got a lot of other battles to fight. This is easy. I'll be back later today with a new music. And he goes, don't you dare. Shut <laughs> your face. Get out. You're done here, Wolf. And he threw me out of the meeting. It's just <laughs> remarkable. I am I so amazed. I looked at Glenn Panic. You know, Glenn, Glenn Patnick, who is... Who Glenn Patnick, boss. who hired me to write Who's the Boss. So that's how well I know Glenn Patnick. I love Glenn Patnick. And I looked at Glenn, and, you know, Glenn kind of sotto voce said to Larry, look, anything that's important to you, I will fight with you for it. But Wolf makes a good point. <laughs> out! Get out! <laughs> so he threw me out of the meeting, and, of course, the music stayed. Now, the funny coda to all of this is... That list of changes, none of them happened. It's a testament to so many things, Larry David's brilliance and vision. Um, and I, stubbornness. And stubbornness. And I also think it shows what a wimp, for example, I am. Um, <laughs> because when I hear that story of the head of the network saying, we could go to a second season if you make these changes – my entire being focuses on whatever you want, boss. I just want that second season. If it doesn't in any way damage what I think is, you know, the central premise of the series, music, sure. Costumes, I don't know. Lighting, I, we could futz with that. That's the kind of caving that I would be imagine myself doing in that meeting. I'm, that, I'm with you, Robert. I, you know, I've changed a lot of music in my career me too because of notes like that or whatever reason i did multiple themes for the same show of course but larry saying no way well and you have to think about it this way too this is this isn't multi hundred million dollar larry who can walk and do whatever he wants this is larry who's putting it all out there on a show that is is on the chopping block makes it here. even more remarkable and yeah, thank like, god for like, that and, like George Costanza in the yeah. pilot meeting where he said, I will not sacrifice my artistic integrity. And Jerry goes, you're not artistic and you have no integrity. It's <laughs> <laughs> so perfect. Which is, which is you know, th a lot of the writing in that show is, is based off of true events, right? I mean, that, that whole basis of that season of writing a pilot is based on Larry and and Jerry writing the show. There was always a kernel of reality from which these episodes and their broad B, C, and D stories sprang. I think the real takeaway from this tale, though, is look how right Larry David was. Mm -hmm. I mean, the world is a better place, and I rarely start any sentence that way these days because of your theme being part of Seinfeld. It's just <laughs> integral. It's... As much a language of the show, we all know that. I hear it here as we're playing little samples of it, and it makes me smile instantly. It's sort of, yeah, that's the sound of Seinfeld. And if there's six billion people on the planet, six billion of them would hear that cue or that theme and say, oh, I know what that is. Larry David had a moment there. I hate to pontificate. On the other hand, let me continue. <laughs> Larry David had a moment where that could have gone south, and you could have written, It's Jerry show. It's Jerry show. Oh, Jerry Seinfeld's on the TV now. That could have been your theme. Something like that. Instead, we got exactly what 
you did, which is so wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Kenny's sitting there thinking, Wolf actually did do that. <laughs> For when the Jerry show aired, I did one of those banal, silly, sassy saxophone themes for the jerry show and um and those would have been the lyrics what you just sang would have been the lyrics it's good those those lyrics are actually copyrighted and that's a bmi uh now i think i have an automatic (laughs) put that anything i sing jonathan i have a question for you about something that i'm an avid seinfeld watcher and it always stood out to me in the premiere of season three the theme song has a singer in it and I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna play a quick clip of it. Every time somebody recommends a doctor, always the best. Always is he good? Always the best. This guy's the best. They can't all be the best. There can't be this many best. Someone's graduating at the bottom of these classes. Where are these doctors? Is somewhere someone saying to their friend, "You should see my doctor. He's the worst." Oh yeah, he's the worst. He's the absolute worst there is. Whatever you've got, it'll be worse after you see him. You hear them, hey. Is it a beat? I don't know what they're saying there, but this was something that only, if I'm not mistaken, this is only in the one episode of the entire series, and then it completely disappears. Yeah, first of all, the, the lyrics were nonsense, non-English gibberish. I, at the time, I had no great Jones to change the Seinfeld music, but I'm walking on a sidewalk with Jerry, and he's said hey it's a new season we're actually got an order for another season what can we do to polish things up you know to put a new spin on things and he mentioned this song that he heard that was scat vocals would that work and so you know like you know sure i i can give that a try let's see if you like it so i didn't love the new added element but hey I had nine other series to crank out at the time, so I was too busy to obsess about it. Seinfeld still had no audience and no permanent time slot, so it seemed to matter very little. At the mix, Jerry liked it. Larry David liked it. Okay. We mixed three episodes with the added gibberish vocals before the first one, the note, aired and finally network and studio heard those vocals in there because clearly they weren't watching their you know they each get a finished mixed tape you know at the time they came on three quarter inch tapes but apparently nobody watched their tape of (laughs) Seinfeld's because we would already given them three episodes So when it aired, the network and studio execs who were not consulted Mm. concerning the added vocals finally saw this episode, The Note, and did not like, A, that they weren't consulted, and they weren't crazy about the vocals. Um, Hmm. It's a valid point. So the first episode, Kenny, as you noticed, had already aired, but the other two had not. So we remixed episodes two and three with normal Seinfeld music. But since the note had already aired, the scat vocals remain in that one episode. Precious. And, yeah. And Angie and I still get these ridiculously small SAG checks huh. for the reuse and for the residuals on that one episode of scat singing. And then it just as the show evolved, you mentioned that, uh, you know, the slap bass yeah. w- wasn't quite a thing, but the theme definitely evolved into more of a, it, it's like a combination of sample and what sounds like more of a live playing bass. Was this just the show's getting picked up, you're spending more time evolving it, or was there talks about that? How does that how does that change? Because you had something going there with the original. Thank you for noticing that the bass evolved and that I started using more uh, fingered bass and different fretting techniques along with the original slap. But at a certain point, I think season seven, maybe season eight, again, 
it's on a sidewalk. I'm walking with Jerry. And Jerry makes notice of it. He says, I really love that, that it's changed, that it's really cool. But you know what? Sometimes I miss the old classic sound of those original Seinfeld music pieces. The ones that they wanted to throw out. Yeah. And he said, would it be wrong? Is it okay if we mix in some of the old ones, like from a library style? And I said, no, I think that's cool. So you will notice in the later seasons more of those older sounding Seinfeld music cues <laughs> sprinkled amongst the new cues. Just looking back at all of this, everyone has this dream of landing a show. I mean, you're connected to one of the most popular shows in the history of television. This show is probably on on a television at some point, like at all hours of the day, it's syndicated so much. In every time zone on the planet. What's that like just looking back on the success of the show and being connected to a show like this and striking gold on, on something like this? Again, I know you, you paved your way by, by working all the way up to a show like this, but you got to think about the luck factor on that and just knowing that you were in the right place at the right time. And do you, do you reflect on that quite often? You can, sometimes you just get on the right bus. Yeah. You know? Isn't that the and, truth? Yeah. I just happened to get on the right show at the right time. And a show that nobody thought was ever going to make it. It's a little show that could. And like you said, it's a global sensation. I'm talking all over the world. My royalties overseas way out distance my royalties domestic and it's so curious and i hope that young composers hear this that um all the planning in the world that you could have done coming up as a musician thinking about coming to hollywood thinking about writing theme songs did was there ever a page that you turned in the story of your life that said okay you know the next thing i'm gonna do i'm gonna write the biggest show ever theme song <laughs> on a slap bass and mouth sounds and it's going to change television my income my career or is it simply george wallace one day calling you to say hey man um my buddy's in a bind <laughs> yeah i mean and no one understands that that's the randomness of any career in the entertainment business. Yeah, I'm going to turn it around to make it a sad tale. Please. I was not the first composer on Seinfeld. Oh, that's even better. Isn't that sad that some, you know, that there's, there's a guy out there who did the pilot? People, you know how many people talk about we should go out? This is what they're talking about. <laughs> this whole thing, we're all out now. No one is home. Not one person here is home. We're all out. There are people trying to find us. They don't know where we are. <laughs> Did you read? I can't find him. Where did he go? He didn't tell me where he was going. He must have gone out. You want to go out. You get ready. You pick out the clothes, right? You take the shower, get all ready, get the cash, get your friends, the car, the spot, the reservation. Then you stand around. What do you do? You go, we got to be getting back. <laughs> Once you're out, you want to get back. You want to go to sleep. You want to get up. You want to go out again tomorrow, right? Wherever you are in life, it's my feeling you've got to go. This guy, he did an okay job on the pilot. It just, he did not, appro he approached it from a musical standpoint, and, and the music was good. It just did not, it, first of all, it was not a sonic brand. It did not instantly identify the show with an earworm so recognizable, so unique that people from another room with their head in the refrigerator would go, ooh, what's this Pavlovian response? I want to watch this show. He didn't do that. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I took his job. But the answer to the question is, no, it was just a good day at work. Yeah. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Sometimes you, you can't really plan for these things. Although I knew that I had to work really hard because I have – no family in Hollywood, and I'm not pretty. So <laughs> perfect. Hey, I I noticed that on your your movie. There's some really 
unbelievably beautiful composers in that movie. These guys look good. Yeah, it's, it's... See, I didn't have that. Yeah, there, there, there was, there was, there's a lot. Anyone who has not seen this film, it's worth it. Well, it sounds it's like we could do a documentary on you and all of all of <laughs> your short. incredible themes. That would be. Has anyone approached you to do any sort of? documentary i know i've seen little vignettes done on the on the theme but there's a lot of stories here if you gathered up all the crew that could be a an interesting tale well people people have mentioned it but nobody with the jack to do it and license the material yeah we wanted to talk to you we thought if you provide the jack (laughs) we have some cameras i know my monuments eat Cheerios in the morning. I don't oh. do movies about me. I, I, I'm is one of the reasons why I left Hollywood is because there's a little bit too much emphasis on the hero. People name their children things like Frank Sinatra Jr. and Quincy Jones the Third, And, you know, I just did not want my kids. There's no to, Jonathan Wolf Jr.? There is not. And if, you know, and by the way, after working 20 hour days every day, the last thing I wanted to do was go home and hear someone practicing their clarinet or go to a Suzuki or something. <laughs> so my kids were deprived in their young years of music lessons entirely. And that kind of guaranteed that they weren't going to say, well, I'll just inherit dad's empire. Uh, once we moved safely to Kentucky, all the kids got music lessons, and my piano from the studio is in the house now. That Will and Grace piano, I play it every day. That's just beautiful and sounds impossibly healthy. I think you should do, we should either do a documentary or you should do a seminar here. Ha! When I'm left alone at home and unsupervised, I make little piano videos and I post them and nobody watches them, but uh, it's fun. Check them out. Well, you can follow Jonathan Wolf at Seinfeld Music, if you want to get in touch with him. Uh, Jonathan, this has been a, an absolute pleasure for us. Incredible. Um, I'm a huge Seinfeld fan. It, it shows up in my life at least once a day, whether it's the show or a quote. So this has been an absolute pleasure uh, for you to join us on Theme Song Throwback. Jonathan, what a treat. I know that if, by any chance, a score... The podcast fan is in Louisville, Kentucky. We're going to post your all your information. So that we're not going. You to can do find that. him at Monk's Coffee Shop in Louisville, Kentucky. <laughs> oh, it's so great to share this time with you, Jonathan. We appreciate your time, Robert Kenny. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed that bonus episode theme song throwback. A quick reminder before we go. Go to score-movie.com slash store. That's the Score Store. There you can get copies of Score, a film music documentary on Blu-ray, even the bonus DVD that has all the raw interviews uh, from the film, and our official merchandise. Get your official Score the Podcast t-shirt. And if you get a t-shirt, make sure to take a picture of yourself and send it to us on social media, and we'll be sure to share it. We love seeing it. Thanks for your continued support, and we'll see you next week. 